Um, as you said, this joint work together with Daniel Dietsch, who is here in the audience, and Bad Chen Rothenberg. Uh, credits go especially to her for this work. She did most of the things. And the original plan was that she is giving the talk, but unfortunately, she uh, could not travel to this conference. Okay. So I want to start or motivate this by telling you a story what typically happens if I uh, verify some program. So typically I write some code and um, yeah, then I start the verifier and hope for some result. And then I wait and I see the tool is doing something. I wait longer and then maybe after some hours I get a result. And then typically I see, oh no, I did a very stupid mistake, so the tool says you did something wrong and, well, I just forgot to pass a result correctly or so. Then I quickly fix this problem and I start the tool again. And it runs again for four hours and again I get a result and I see, oh no, I did another mistake. And so this continues for some time. And yeah, it's such a pity because it seems the tool where I restart the tool from scratch and it seems that the tool is doing partly the same work over and over again. So it would be, it would be so nice if the tool could reuse some of this old work. And a similar scenario is you have a large software project and you receive, you want to verify it continuously and you receive a lot of patches. Uh, several patches a day or several patches an hour and then it would be so nice if you could just reuse old work because typically these patches change only minor things of the program. Okay, so this is uh, what this talk is about. You have a program and you construct modified versions of this program and you want to verify those again and you probably want to reuse information. Okay, so this is the structure of this talk. I first want to start with a running example and some preliminaries. And later I will do some definitions that use this the preliminaries. So even if they sound a bit boring, um, they might be important. Then I want to show you the trace abstraction verification technique. This is an existing technique, but we think it's especially well suited for re reusing information. And afterwards I want to discuss um, what kind of information or what kind of things that uh, is, are produced by the algorithm can be used for later verification tasks. Okay, I want to start with this running example. So this is a very small program. It is motivated by some pointer that is initially not the null pointer. And then we have a while loop where we have another variable n. It is an integer and it is decremented in every iteration of this loop. And only in the very last iteration this pointer is set to zero and the correctness specification of this program is given by this assert statement here and it says this pointer should not be the null pointer. So obviously um, this program is correct because this constraint here, um, well, it can only be violated after we execute this here, this uh, we P is set to zero, but we can execute this only in the very last iteration of the loop, so we'll never reach this statement back again. Okay, and a notation that we will use in this talk is uh, this um, kind of control flow graph, where the nodes are the locations of the program and the edges are labeled by program statements. Okay, so what is a kind of correctness proof for such a program? Well, it's an annotation and we call this annotation a floyd hoare annotation. And this is the, uh, these are the preliminaries that I want to introduce. So I want to first uh, remind you what is a hoare triple. So hoare triple uh, consists of those three parts, a formula, some statement, and another formula. And we say that such a hoare triple is valid if the following holds, namely if the program is in some state where the first formula holds. 
And then, if we execute the statement, the program is in a um, state where this letter formula holds. Okay, so this is a standard definition, and here is an example. Um, so if the pointer is not the null pointer, or n is equal to minus 1, and we execute this assume statement, so the statement assumes that n is not equal to 0, then it holds afterwards that p is not the null pointer. Well, because this here is in contradiction to the second uh, disjunct, and then only this here may hold. Uh, okay, and then what is such a floyd hoare annotation? Well, it is an annotation, uh, as you can see here, where every location of the program is annotated with a formula such that the following holds. So for every edge here in the program, the annotation of the preceding location, the statement that is labeled to the edge, and the annotation of the succeeding um, location, they have to form a Hort triple. And if we have such an annotation, well, then we know um, uh, if we have such a notation and the initial location is annotated by the formula true and the error location is annotated by the formula false, then we know that the program is correct. Yeah, this is what this, this proposition states. And yeah, this is nothing new, but I will later make a definition that is very similar to this. Um, okay, so, but now let's have a look at a, slight, um, a slightly modified version of this program. So what I did here, I changed here the first statement. So I introduced here an if statement and effectively in the control flow graph, this leads here to another branch. So originally we had only this possibility to go from L0 to L1 by assuming that p is not equal to zero. Now there's another option. We can assume um, that p is zero, so that p is the null pointer, but then we have to set n to minus two. Okay, so the program is still correct, because if n is set to minus two, we cannot even execute this loop once, and there's no chance to reach the error location. But the proof here, is not a valid proof anymore because, well, well uh, here for the reason that this location does not have an annotation, but we could annotate it, or no matter how we annotate it, um, the, this annotation here, this statement, and this annotation here would not be a valid triple. So it's no option to directly reuse this proof. Okay, so what uh, do existing techniques do? Well, existing techniques try to prove that um, this program or the, the modified version is similar to um, the original version in some sense, well, which does not apply here. Or something that techniques typically do is they just reuse the predicates from this proof. So we know that for this program it was important, for, for example, that we um, reason somewhere by using the formula that p is not equal to zero or that n is equal to one. And so it's probably useful to, to use this information. But if we just reuse all these predicates, we have to recompute some abstraction of this program. So we have to recompute this annotation because we have to rearrange these formula in some new uh, these formulas in some new way, or uh, add more formulas, and this always comes with additional costs. Okay, and I want to show you next this um, trace abstraction verification technique because we think that there we can reuse even more than just the predicates or some other parts uh, of the proof. Okay, yeah, so next I go, I'm going to introduce you this uh, technique, uh, to this technique and I want to start with some basic notions that we typically use there. So I want to make the definition of a trace and the trace for us is a sequence of statements. Then we have 
the notion of an error trace, and an error trace is something that you can see here. It's a sequence of statements that labels a path from the initial location to the error location. Okay, and typically such a path could be a counterexample to the correctness of the program, but it does not have to be, because not every trace is feasible. So we, here I made a table where we can see um, how we can characterize traces. So a trace can be an error trace of the program or not an error trace of the program. And the trace can be infeasible or it can be feasible. And so here's an example for an error trace of the program um, that is infeasible. So here P, we assume that P is not equal to zero. Here we assume that P is equal to zero. Um, so we cannot execute those statements in this sequence. Um, yeah, other examples are this here. So according to our notion, this is a trace, but it's a trace that does not even occur in the program. Or this here, it's a, it's a trace that is feasible, but it's not uh, a trace of this program. Uh, okay, so the the notion, uh, what, I, what I want to also to say, the notion of feasibility is completely independent of a program. So um, here, yeah, the, we have sequences of statements that do not occur successively in the program. Um, but the notion of an error trace depends on really on a concrete program. And now the question is, does a program has an error trace that is feasible? So this is the question that we want to answer. But if, because if this is the case, the program is incorrect. And if no such trace exists, the program is correct. Okay, so the, the approach in trace abstraction is we want to show that every error trace is infeasible. Then we know the program is correct. And we do this by decomposing the set of infeasible uh, traces. Uh, of infeasible error traces into sets such that every t there is a simple infeasibility proof for each set. Um, so for example, in this program, we, co we could have partitioned or we can partition um, the set of traces into two sets. So one set is the set of traces um, where we take uh, here this uh, if branch set this pointer to zero and go then to the error location. But all these traces are infeasible because um, for doing so, we have to set, or we assume here that n is equal to zero because we do the can execute this only in the last iteration of the loop. And then this violates next time the condition to enter the loop. Or other traces are those that do not take the if branch here go along this here, and those are all infeasible for a simple reason, namely, if p is initially not zero, it is never set to zero, it cannot be zero while uh, we enter here the um, error location. Okay, and how do we implement this approach? And we implement this by using automata theoretic operations. So one of the concepts in this trace abstraction approach is that we say we can consider the set of statements of a program just as an alphabet of a formula language. So in this view, there is no further meaning attached to the statements. This is just a simple alphabet. And then we can represent set of traces by using automata. And one example are, uh, here is the error traces of a program. These can be represented by this automaton and it looks exactly like the control flow graph of the program. And the initial location of the program will be the initial state of the, of the automaton and the error location of the program will be an accepting state of the program. Okay, and then an error trace is a word accepted by this, by this program.
Okay, now I want to show you how we verify a program using trace abstraction on an example. Well, I'll uh, show you this on this example. So we have already seen an example for an error trace and our algorithm first picks such an error trace. And I want to emphasize this is a purely automata theoretic operation. So we do not have to consider the semantics of the program statements. We just um, yeah, check how we can reach the error location in this graph. Okay, so the first step is we take this trace. And the next step is we consider this trace as a program, just as a straight line code program consisting of these th three statements. And now we can use any um, verification technique to analyze the correctness of this trace. And luckily here, this trace is correct, and we assume we have some verification technique that computes for us such a nice annotation that is a proof for the correctness of this straight line code consisting of these th three statements. Okay, and now as a next step, we want to generalize this program. So we have a program that is correct, and now we want to generalize this to a larger program that consists not only of a straight line code, but of more statements. And how can we do this? So we want to maintain the property that this pro is a correct program. And how can we do this? Well, we can do this by checking before we uh, add a, a statements if um, the annotation before and after this edge that we add, um, yeah, if this uh, is a valid or triple. So here in this example, we add here a self loop with n minus minus with this statement, and we are allowed to do so because um, this here is a valid or triple. Okay, so we have now some, some technique to extend a program, a correct program, uh, by additional statements and the program is still correct. Okay, so this is what we do. Uh, and we, yeah, we can do this here um, more intensively by adding more statements. And uh, we can even merge locations if they are labeled with the same statement. And now I want to recall this, uh, this uh, information, uh, ah, this definition that we had a bit at, be at the beginning, namely the definition of a Floyd Hoare annotation. So what we did with this program, or the property that this uh, thing here has, is very similar to the, pro uh, to the um, property of this Floyd, Floyd Hoare annotation. And therefore, we call this here a Floyd Hoare automaton. So we want to consider this here as an automaton, but as an automaton that is labeled with um, information about program states. And since this is very similar to a Floyd Hoare annotation, we call this Floyd Hoare automaton. And now, after the first iteration of the algorithm, we end up with the original program, we still don't know if, if it's correct or not. And with this program that has this nice property that um, every trace of this program is infeasible, so it's a correct program. And now, how can we continue? Well, we now say we consider both as automata, and now we check the th uh, set theoretic difference of both. So these this automaton accepts the error traces of the program. These are the traces that we are interested in. And this automaton here accepts a set of infeasible traces. And so we can now just subtract from all error traces the infeasible traces. And only the traces that are left are those that we have to consider in the further uh, verification. Okay, now, unfortunately, this difference is not yet empty. Um, so we can, again, uh, check for a counterexample and we find one. Okay, and now we continue as before. So we check this trace, we compute a proof for this trace, we extend, we consider this as an automaton, we extend it by uh, additional uh, edges, 
And now we end up, we have two correct programs that we can consider as automata that accept only traces that are infeasible. And now in this case, um, this inclusion holds. So every error trace of the program um, is an infeasible trace. And so we know the program is correct. Um, okay, I quickly want to show you the, the algorithm. So here we, we start with a program, we, we do some emptiness check, then we pick some error trace. So this is marked uh, red to indicate that this is a pure automata theoretic operation. Then we check feasibility. So there we need the, to have a look at the semantics of the program. And then we generalize this and get a new automaton that we can add to this set and we continue like this. Okay, and now the question, if we follow this verification approach, what could we reuse here? So what kind of information can we use from one program over to the next program? Do you have an idea? What do you think? No, but um, I verified one program. Uh huh. But what do I uh, then reuse for the next program, even if I only do this small modification? Um, yes, right. Uh, so I, I want to reuse the traces for, for which I know that they are infeasible. So what I reuse effectively are the automata. Okay, so here I have now the modified program that you have seen before. So here I added something and now I want to verify this program very quickly. I do not want to have a look at counterexample traces and now what can I do? I just use the automata that I have produced before because these automata accepted only traces that are infeasible. And yeah, now I just use them. And now I check if the new program intersected with, um, or if I remove from the new program all the traces from this and from this if this is empty. And unfortunately, this is not the case. Um, we have here a counterexample to emptiness, namely if we go along this here, because these are two new statements. They have not been in uh, the language of these automata, so they are not there. But what I can do is I just follow the same approach as before and construct a new automaton. So here I have a third automaton, and then um, this intersection is empty. And in this case, I have proven correctness of this program and I only had to produce one new automaton. Okay, so this was simple, but then I want to have a look at a different program. Now, this is a bit more complicated. Here, I also made a change. Namely, before I had here an assume statement where I assumed that P is not equal to zero. Now, I set P to 23 and um, yeah, what happens now? I want also want to check if every error trace from this program is included in those two sets of infeasible traces. And unfortunately, um, this is not, a ca not the case. Not even a single error trace is contained in the language of these automata. And why? Well, because the alphabet is different. Here we have a new alphabet with a new symbol and this new symbol occurs in every error trace. Okay, so what can we do? We want to reuse as much information that we have. So we want to reuse those automata, but now we have this problem with the new symbol. Okay, and so what, what we can do is, now we check again hard triples but we only check quadruples for this new symbol 
for this new statement that we introduced in the program. And for example, here for this automaton, we check that this four triple year is valid and we add this additional edge. And when we do this for more um, of the Hoa triples, and in fact, we can delete this old edge here because this symbol does not occur in the program anymore. And then we get this automaton where we have here now self loops with the new alphabet and well, more statements and in fact, all statements that are needed. We do the same with this automaton and now we have again that the um, that if we subtract from all error traces this set of infeasible traces and this set of infeasible traces, we obtain the empty set. We know that every error trace is infeasible and that the program is correct. Okay, so the overall algorithm, or we have two versions of this reuse algorithm. So this is mainly the same algorithm that you have seen before for trace abstraction, but the differences are the input is now also a set of Floyd Hoare automata. The output is also a set of Floyd Hoare automata because we potentially want to reuse the result again for another modified version of the program. And now the first version of this algorithm, it's called the eager algorithm. What, the, what does it do? It starts with all those automata and first takes the new program and just subtracts all the new automata. Okay. But because then there is at the beginning only left what we have to analyze in U. And then we have another uh, algorithm and we call it the, the lazy approach. And there um, the input and the output is similar, but whenever uh, we do not subtract all the automata right from the start, but instead we um, take counter examples as in the original algorithm. And then we give the, uh, we check if this counter example is contained in one of the automata. And then if we find that one of our algorithm automata that we have is suitable, we just subtract this. Um, okay. Yeah. Then we evaluated this. And um, yeah, what, what is here the question? Well, we saved some costs. So um, we do not have to analyze counterexamples in some cases. We do not have to uh, check so many hot triples by reusing automata, but we also have additional costs because we reuse hopefully a lot of automata, but because of this, the automata can become larger. The automata operations can become more costly. Then we sometimes ex extend automata. For this, we also have to check some hot triples and we have additional costs for reading and writing automata. So we have to write them to the hard disk and have to pay with IO operations. So uh, yeah, the question is, does this pay off in practice? So we evaluated this by uh, implementing this in our ultimate automizer tool. And uh, our benchmark set is from this Linux verification center. So this is some group of people that uh, verify individual uh, Linux drivers by consider them in isolation and writing some environment that models um, the Linux kernel. And from them, we got uh, a lot of verification tasks with different revisions of the Linux kernel. And this is a benchmark set that uh, was also used in some related work. Okay, and these are the results. I only want to tell you yeah, what, we, uh, what we measured. So here you see uh, the files. Then here you see how many tasks there were. So how many revisions in, in, in effect. And then what we did is we first evaluated every revision from scratch. Then we did the same. Uh, then we uh, verified those by uh, applying the eager version of the algorithm and the lazy version of the algorithm. And we measured the overall speed up and the speed up for the analysis time. So there we just ignored the time that we need for reading and writing. And uh, we compared this to this related work that was done in the Aquarius group. And so here 
Yeah, and for some examples, we really received a very high speed up, and unfortunately, there were some where the speed up was, uh, or where we had to pay even higher costs. And the speed up was worse than in this related work, but overall, we received a speed up um, of around factor eight to nine which was um, yeah, nearly twice as much as in this related work. Okay, yeah, I want to conclude with, uh, with these results and thank you for your attention. So we have time for a quick question. So I think your, your approach assumes that uh, the alphabet is only increased. What happens if you remove some statements from your alphabet? Ah, yeah, that's perfect for us. Then we can just drop these statements or these edges and the automata become even smaller. But if it's the first statement in the automaton, then the automaton language becomes empty, so you cannot remo uh, reuse any information. Ah, so you mean that the statements are not only dropped, but rearranged in the program. Yes, in, in this case, we have to check additional hot triples and also rearrange them or yeah, rearrange them in our automata. Okay, so yes. I have one important question which was, uh, I, I was asked it and I just uh, transferred mm -hmm. it. Is your shirt for sale? Ah, <laughs> uh, no, no, and I have only one of these, but yeah, I should say this is, uh, this shirt advertises our tool. So it's the shirt of the ultimate automizer tool. Okay, so let's uh, thank Matthias again.